Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Star Citizen Live. This week is our Alien Week Roundtable. Uh, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. And if you've never seen Star Citizen Live before, it's where we take about an hour out of our days at the end of a week, uh, usually on Friday. Are there any other days at the end of the week? Probably not. Uh, it's a good show already. Um, to, to basically sit here, hang out with some of our uh, Star Citizen community members. Uh, sometimes we answer questions. Sometimes we explore process. Uh, uh, last week, we, 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 made, we, made a, we made a ship with concept artist uh, Sarah McCullough. This week, we have uh, the esteemed members of our lore team here uh, to discuss, uh, to kick off Alien Week, which is our uh, celebration of all the different cultures uh, throughout the Star Citizen universe uh, that... Uh, aren't us, I guess. Uh, so let's go ahead and go around the, the group and introduce our panel of guests. We'll just start in the upper what, upper left here and just go clockwise. Uh, that means, Sherry, you're up first. Uh, Sherry, who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? Hi, I'm Sherry. I am the uh, archivist slash associate writer at Star Citizen. Um, Sorry, there's there's some voices in the background that you know you know this just happens when you're at home. Some some people are in meetings yep. at the same time that you're recording a cool video for everybody. <laughs> but I uh, do the alien language stuff with our very talented, wonderful language contractor Britton Watkins. Um, do space science and do the Galactopedia, which you may have heard of once or twice. Uh, and I want to compliment you on your Seven Samurai poster in the back. Thanks, it's vintage. <laughs> All right, moving clockwise over. Dave, who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? I am Dave Haddock. I'm the narrative director uh, and do a bit of everything. Uh, probably too much. Um, <clears throat> and also, Jared, just to, just to correct you, I think Saturday would also be another end of the week. Uh, it's not just Friday. So. Yeah, it's an option. Just it's an option. Yeah, just saying. If you want to get technical. See, I was going to compliment you on your Seven Samurai poster, but now I'm not going to. That's it's fair. not as nice as Sherry's. <laughs> uh, moving down clockwise, Will, who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? Hi, I, I'm Will. I help Star Citizen. <coughs> um, sorry, which which camera should I look at? Which This one? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, the lead writer here at Star Citizen. I do all sorts of narrative stuff. That's one of my favorite things about Star Citizen is narrative is everywhere. So, yeah, we help write missions. We come up with world building stuff. We come up with cool aliens that we're going to talk about today. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really great project to be a part of. Thanks, Good. everyone. And uh, excellent work on your Seven Samurai poster. I think I'm thinking about upgrading to an eight samurai, but I'm waiting for it to come out. <laughs> and last, uh, there's Adam. All right, so uh, on the show this week, we are no, no, Adam. Who are you, and what do you do for Star Citizen? <laughs> I mean, you hit it right on the head. I'm Adam, um, and I'm a writer. Uh, so I work with Dave and Will and Sherry um, on everything they just described. I support them and uh, helping develop the everything we're doing, the cultures and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. I feel your Seven Samurai poster is not as nice as everybody else's. I just yeah. I want to be honest. It's it's okay. It's got a big tear in it, but um, it was still nice. Right. So, what are we doing this week? Uh, we, uh, this week is the kickoff of a of a of, of a round of festivities uh, we're referring to as Alien Week. Uh, you can learn more about everything that's going into that on the robertspaceindustries.com website. Uh, what we are doing today is we are answering your questions related to the, the lore, the history, the background of the alien races that populate the Star Citizen uh, universe. Uh, as usual, uh, we take questions from multiple sources. Uh, if you're watching live in Twitch right now, uh, you can submit your question with the word question in capital letters surrounded by brackets. Uh, you can also do so on Spectrum, our communication platform on Robert spaceindustries.com. Our community management team will use that to help pull the questions out of all the other conversation. Uh, we also put a thread up earlier in the week to collect questions and allow them to be voted up by our backers, uh, for maybe for folks who couldn't be here or just to see which ones they wanted to see answered first. So we're going to start in with those as is want to do. I do want to remind folks as you're submitting questions this week that we are here with the lore team, the story team. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your questions are, when is this ship coming out? Um, We'll 
we be able to play alien races in the game, which was another real popular one that came up, uh, stuff like that. Uh, these are these are not the folks for that. Will we be able to have a aliens as NPCs? There were lots of great questions. Unfortunately, this is not the group for those. So keep your questions story focused, and we should be good from here on out. The first question, the most top voted question, was one that you could probably anticipate. Uh, it was simply when. When will we find out more about the Kurthak, the most elusive of star citizens' alien races? Yes. Uh, at some point? <clears throat> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 know, I know it's hard sometimes because we have all this lore that's building and you want to know everything right away. But we mentioned this before, but it's really trying to strike that balance between uh, having fun stuff and establishing the universe now and really saving stuff to be experienced for the game in general when it comes down. So we're always trying to balance it. Whereas like, this is a really fun story we could share right now, but wouldn't it be cooler if players got the surprise of it, got to experience it for the first time in game playing it. So we, we have our secret treasure trove where we keep things hidden and safe for it. Yeah, and, and and again, there's also like we we're still kind of working our way through the the Xion and the Banu and the Tavaran and the Vandal and stuff like that. So, you know, I mean, to give some context for anyone who's unfamiliar with the Kurthak, they were they were actually originally a stretch goal, uh, which was uh, kind of funny. Uh, but um, but yeah, so they were definitely like conceived of to be a little bit further down the line. But there was also an expectation at the time of you know whether we would hit it or not. Uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, so it, it kind of needed to have enough of a flavor when introducing it that that you kind of got a sense of how they would f fit into the universe, but also give ourselves an out in case we didn't hit it. So uh, if they disappeared, you know, the universe wasn't suddenly having to rewrite itself to to factor in an alien race that suddenly was gone. Um, right. But. Uh, since we, we've gained quite a lot, quite a, quite a, quite a few uh, citizens since those early days, uh, there are probably many folks who have maybe never even heard of the Kurthak. Um, I know you gave us the, the stretch goal thing, but it, it, do you remember the the, the, the blurb, the log line? Uh, yeah, the primer the, for them. The original thing was that basically they were uh, sort of they had uh, more, not mortal enemies of the the Xion, but they were basically located on the opposite side of the Xion Empire from the UEE. So, uh, but they had been locked in a very very long uh, war with the Xion mm -hmm. called the Spirit Wars, uh, and the Xion were very very cagey about telling us anything about them, uh, and you know really wanted to make sure that we didn't kind of make contact with them. So that was that was the kind of original pitch uh, set up for them. All right. Uh, uh, the question from the chat: Will you just reveal already that the Kurthak are th are the cat people from Wing Commander? Uh, that might come from a B Lesnick. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it because he wouldn't have called them cat people. That's that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Um, ah uh, heck! Uh, <laughs> can I also just take the time to wish everyone a happy first contact day? So. Happy first contact day. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do you want to take a moment to explain what first contact day was? Uh, it's the day where we had first contact yeah. with the Banu. The Banu were the first alien species that we came into contact with. It was a fun misunderstanding. Uh, you can read it about it on the website, but it was uh, a, you know Banu out wandering around, and it was very tense. But it went pretty well considering when Banu have been one of our longest and closest allies through. Uh, for the empires up and downs. Well, uh, and, I mean, to be more clear, it was a he was running. Uh, it, it, was it Johnny or Jimmy or what was his Jerry. name? Jerry. Jerry. Uh, yeah, they, you know, and then he got shot at. Uh, by a <laughs> Jerry the Banu. Yeah. I think if it had been any other species, it might have gone quite a bit different. But the the Banu but, were with the punchers pretty well. Yeah. Right. The Banu are interstellar friends to all. Uh, <laughs> What can you tell us about? Uh, uh, we, we we know about the Vandal, the Vandal, the Banu, the Xion, the Tavaran, and uh, we just got done talking about the Kurthak. Uh, what can you tell us about species on developing worlds? Oh, we have a few of those. Um, for those who don't 
know what a developing world is or developing civilization. It's one that is inhabited by um, a species of that that is self-aware. You might you might call it sentient in some works of science fiction. They they use tools. They're like developing technology. Like they're they're moving forward onto a path that seems to indicate that one day they will join us in space. Um, and the UEE has this law in place called the Fair Chance Act that prohibits interference from any of the developed civilizations. Um, basically, this was put in place to prevent another massacre of Garen II, which was a genocide of the developing species on the planet Garen II, conducted by a terraforming, terraforming company that had ties to the Imperator Linton Messer the 11th. And it was the um, the last inciting incident that led to the fall of the Messers and the end of the Messer era. Everybody so, knows yeah. the odd number Messers are the bad ones. <laughs> Just like the Star Trek movies. <laughs> hey, I will, bro- I will broach no ill speak of Star Trek 3. It's a good movie. That's Search for Spock, right? That's Search for Spock. It's Christopher Lloyd yeah, inventing the modern day Klingon. Yeah, and they found him, so. And they found him, so mission accomplished. <laughs> It's all, it's all good. Yeah, we have a, we have a couple of developing civilizations. We have um, you might have just read about the Osoyans because I published a Galactopedia article on them. They um, we can't get too much into their final design, but we do know that they communicate light through color displays like cuttlefish, which is fascinating and very hard for us to parse because we use our mouth parts to speak. It's like cuttlefish and I will, death punch. I will do, throw out a fun uh, behind-the-scenes trivia thing. Uh, I had actually, when I, the Asoians first appeared in the Lost Generation story, and uh, I had done a rough sketch that I, I showed to somebody on the team of what I was sort of thinking they looked like, mm. and I was told to, quote, never ever show that to the animators, end quote. <laughs> so. They would cry. Yes, uh, many a bad idea comes from me. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on Vandal NPCs in the Persistent Universe? Watch out for them, probably. <laughs> yeah. Do not uh, interact. Yeah. Run. <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess it's a, it's sort of a two pronged question of like you know whether that's NPCs as far as like. Um, hostile forces that you could potentially come across or NPCs as like, you know, hey, there's a Vandal shopkeeper named Jerry. I was uh, gonna say, that's exactly where I was going. Uh-huh. Is there a Vandal it's Jerry, Jerry along with a uh, Banu Jerry? Uh, <laughs> I mean, as it stands now, I mean, you know, the, the hope is that as you start kind of getting closer to the, the, the systems that are, you know, near the Vandal border, you're going to have to start dealing with them as a possible raiding force. Uh, but um you know and we've alluded in the past that there are there are certain banu that have managed to establish you know trade relations with with vandul but uh you know and 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 sort of hinted that you know there's a possibility that maybe a human could try and pull it off but as it stands now like no one's ever done it uh so good luck uh make sure you wear your armor yeah, and, and with the Vandals having clans and stuff, when we start getting to those border systems, I think, you know, you'll start seeing kind of the differences start emergencing between the different groups of Vandals you encounter, and that might take the form of, you know, actually having recognizable, we don't want them to be a unified, just yeah. faceless force that attacks you, right. and like all that kind of stuff, so there, there will be plans to develop it, but as far as like dealing with them while the active war is going on, you know, I think that's going to be a, a tricky proposition for anyone in, in the UAE to accomplish. Well, and also coming going off what Will was saying earlier, like, you know, there is that thing too of, you know, if say, for example, like, you know, we publish a thing next week, that's like, Oh, Hey, you know, so-and-so found Jerry the Vandal and he's super friendly and stuff like that. Like that's not that satisfying from a player perspective standpoint like wanting to save the development of you know where the future goes from here in the universe like you know while until players can actually start to theoretically be able to affect that change is much more dynamic and interesting it's sort of it's it's kind of kind of what you talked about before it's there is an there there is a not insignificant amount of lore (laughs) already out there uh for star citizen uh and and that said it's still 
I, I understand the desire to still keep things closer to the chest. You know, uh, discovery is such a key aspect of of Star Citizen's inten intended you know you know end game. Uh, you don't you don't want to sit there and you know spoil everything on live streams years earlier. Uh, sub it, all alien races are humanoids. How do you make them... All alien races they know about are humanoids. Uh, how do you make them different than humans? Well, I think that's a specious term, first of all. I <laughs> don't think we should be calling them humanoid. Yeah, um, bipedal or die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. It's, it's always that thing of the... I don't know. For me, it was it's, it's that sort of weird balance of like trying to... I mean, we are making a game, so there's that sort of the humans of Star Citizen, of the UEE and stuff like that. Like, you know, how does how do the Shion react with them and stuff like that? So you want to build those sorts of conflicts, and you know, uh, oh, humans believe this, so the Shion might believe that. If we want to make a little bit of kind of headbutting there, um, but um, yeah, I don't know. For me, I, you know, there's also that aspect of like trying to come up with like unique ways that they could have developed like writing out actually we did a time capsule thing for the Xi'an mm -hmm. uh, so writing out their history like big events that happened throughout their history and and that actually really helped kind of establish that mindset of how they would approach something as a, a completely distinct culture yeah I, I think a lot of things too for me is when we start talking about them and even though their physiology may be you know right now two arms and two legs and kind of a torso and kind of a, a general shape like that I, I think a lot of the stuff that we can play with is in their senses and how they experience the world and that gives them a really different perspective on stuff from us like we really like the idea of the banu are quite a hardy species and they can survive temperatures well in excess of what we can on both sides of the range and different atmospheres and stuff like that and so like them kind of being a little more maybe less cautious and blundering and going forward comes as a side effect of that being, you know, hardier. And, you know, the Xi'an have a very long life and they have like duller senses. And so like this kind of more cautious approach all feeds into that. And so we try to think about how are these seeing the world and how is that different hmm. than humans as we go? So I, I think that helps me a lot as a, as a writer kind of create, when I when I'm trying to think about all right, what is the Xi'an way of looking at this? What is the Banu way of looking at this? That makes sense. Um, Jared, will you marry me? Uh, depends on the dowry. Uh, make your <laughs> offers to Ulf. He's my agent. Uh, do the Banu use ground vehicles? I mean, they use they use anything that they think is useful. So I'm going to tentatively say probably. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, just to talk about this, like, I know there's a lot of questions about wanting to expand out the alien ship, you know, thing, mm -hmm. and, and by no means the alien ships that are available for sale right now represent the full range of what alien species fly and drive around in. We, we from the narrative team, it, ships are so important to Star Citizen that we have to be very careful when using them. Like, we... The safer route for us is when we're talking about stuff hundreds of years ago, we have a little more leeway to kind of just write for what we need. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about present day stuff and what you encounter, that takes a lot of coordination between us and the ship design team. And so it's not something we do lightly. So wondering about like, oh, where's the science ships? How come you haven't ever mentioned the Xi'an having a tank and like all this kind of stuff? And that's kind of the reason behind there is that we really try to let them take the forward step with introducing a new ship into the universe and then we follow up so uh are there any alien musical instruments planned Ooh, have you developed good question. Uh, the, qu the question was actually uh musical instruments planned or food and we know we know all about food especially the the uh the banu, I'll talk about the food. Uh, ban banu oh delicacies. we have so much food there goes yeah. the rest of the hour yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, eventually there'll is, be a banu yeah. recipe book yeah, food is a food is a special interest of uh, Will and and me both. So we <laughs> we have spent we have spent many a uh, um, a work hour like developing the cuisine of the different alien species. Uh, look forward to learning more next week. 
It, and it's also one of these things that we have a little more liberty with as, as, as a writing team in the game because, unfortunately, yet we don't have a way for you to taste things uh, when you click on it. But music and stuff you can actually hear, and someone is actually going to have to build that music the way we describe it. So, like, in we in animated. So, we have plans and ideas for that, but that'll take coordination down the road with those separate teams. But food, we can say this tastes like, you know, spicy beetles, and it's and you just have to take our word for that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even though we haven't specified a specific instrument, I know we have called out with the Xi'an that they, oh, they the do opera, yeah. love, like, a certain type of opera, which you could almost compare to, like, very minimalist kind of, like, modern classical music where it's very droney and drawn out since they have long lifespans and it takes them to a meditative state. So we can describe that experience, and it would be, like, Day, a day long opera rather than like a, a four or five hour opera. So it's, uh, it, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we have ideas for where we would like to take that and some sound, but, um, again, it's not something we would go out there and say it's got to be this specific instrument, at least at this point. And, and we've talked a bit about the Tavarin having this kind of unified chanting system as kind of like a timekeeping and keeping everyone in lockstep kind of for their for their movements and stuff and so like yeah, bringing was, all their voices together yeah it was about kind of again because the tavarn also kind of came from a planet where they were you know besieged by a lot of predators so the idea with their music was that they would it would be a lot of like the drum circle becomes kind of the classic example but this idea that you're it's a it's about augmenting the your numbers to make it sound like it's you're a really big fearsome thing so it was that sort of coordinated like i said kind of uh uh rhythmic type thing to kind of amplify your size or boast about kind of the size of like you don't want to come over here there's a big thing here that will mess you up i like to imagine that the tevarin can all harmonize with anyone like john denver could <laughs> yeah. so i guess banu, spoiler alert they are john denver yeah. and the banu <laughs> didn't really have much of a music culture before they encountered the humans and so like they've taken yeah, they've taken to human music strongly as as it's a well-known fact that they enjoy karaoke. Um, and also because of their uh, their less sensitive hearing, they really like music cranked to 11. And so it can be dangerous to go to a, a band new concert. Yeah. That's one more. Uh, this one seems pretty broad. Uh, tell us about Tavarin who serve in the UEEN. Are there Tavarin that serve in the Navy? Yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, the current senators um, is the first Tavarin senator elected, uh, um, was formerly in the Navy and had kind of used, had had joined the uh, the Navy to essentially earn his citizenship and then um, obviously kind of like integrate. And a lot of uh, a lot of Tavarin like to join uh, the Navy or stuff like that as a way to better integrate into the society. And they see it as a, a ladder to maybe kind of uh, to get to better positions and stuff like that. I, one of the current things in the current election cycle we're dealing with is uh, some of the candidates and their their preference to wanting to encourage more Tavarin to join uh, the armed forces and 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 stuff like that as a as a way to kind of like make for a, 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 a give them more opportunities and and kind of a more diverse uh, fighting force for the for the UEE. So there's definitely a lot out there, but I, I'm sure there's still plenty of Tavarin that have no interest in in joining or or just don't. Don't, don't see the use in it. So I, I think it's more of a personal personal choice. Yeah, there's a sort of, I mean, there's an interesting split kind of going on within the Tavarin uh, where there's a certain percentage of them are believing that they, you know, are, are trying to kind of rediscover their old ways and that they, I can't remember if they're in, I think they went to Branagh or Bremen. Yes, uh, Branagh. And, and so they've kind of formed this are trying to kind of go and isolate themselves and kind of start to resurrect kind of the old Tavarin, uh, Rajora and stuff. And then there's another group that sort of Sush Kasi, who's the senator, the Tavarin senator, is sort of spearheading of like, you know, we need to, you know, play our part. We're part of this empire. Let's act like it uh, type thing and, and really trying to inspire the Tavarin to really kind of take up their mantle as, as members of the UEE and, and really do their part. And then there's the third who kind of ignore both and are just sort of like still somewhat disaffected and, and don't want to contribute at all. Yeah, I, I think the 
Tavarn serving in the Navy was a, it was a big step forward for them in, in, in terms of finding their place within the empire, because there was a lot of distrust at the beginning. You know, we were at war with them. They were living among us. They were kind of segregated. And, and so that opportunity, when it occurred, when they made the invitation to allow Tavarin to serve, was kind of the first normalizing step um, for a lot of ways uh, of humanity kind of getting the used to idea that maybe we can trust these these people. So, uh, it's kind of interesting in the historical significance of it. And it still goes on today, I think. You know, Tavarin have a reputation for being fierce warriors. So, in yeah. shedding. Uh, no, I made that one up. Uh, <laughs> this person has, has, has clearly done their homework. So I'm, 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna alter this one. I'm gonna read it just as it is. Humanity made first contact with the Banu in Davian, which is at least five jumps from Banu territory, according to the star map. The Banu in question was not an explorer, but a fugitive, which implies that he knew of those systems already, which in turn implies that other Banu knew about them. In fact, we know they must have, because of Trees, which lies clear across the star map from known Banu space, at least eight jumps by my count, and to make the trip in eight jumps from Geddon would mean going through Terra. In any case, Trees is a long way from Banu space, and, w- and what's between the two is mostly UE space or what's become UE space. So the question is, if the Banu knew about all these uninhabited systems for so long, why didn't they colonize any of them? Uh, I'm going to answer this. Any no Banu who knows the answer is dead, so we'll never know. The end. <laughs> uh, for folks... Uh- who might not know what the context of that answer is, Sherry? Why, why would any, why would the why, why do why does knowledge die with the Banu? So Banu don't really um, preserve historical records that that outline like big events that happen. It's not out of any kind of like malice for past events. It's just because they it's not useful for them to remember stuff like that. You know, like it, their their culture is centered around the present moment, like making things that have use, like tools and instructional guides. So you Yeah, might, they preserve you know, knowledge. Like, they so prefer, like they, yeah, they preserve knowledge. They don't preserve history. So them recording a reason like why why didn't the Banu terraform this random system? No Banu would care enough yes, to write that down. Uh, it, it, and it's kind of like, you know, the humans existing in the UE now, like they, they've kind of noticed this discrepancy of wonder themselves and try to figure it out. And, and it's one thing that it's hard to get uh, travel information from the Banu, the way that we've kind of talked about them setting up their navigational is that it's very proprietary and controlled. And so like, we didn't instantly get access to all the Banu star maps when we became friends with them. It's been a long overtime trading process of finally gaining access. Like you have to purchase rights to get their star map data. And a lot of them are very carefully held because people want to control trade routes. They don't want the humans coming in and, you know, doing these things. And and, and so it's, and it's not like we can just take a Banu ship and download the information because of the way that they build their their drives. It, it's all hard coded into it, and you can't remove it out. And so it's kind of an interesting thing where they're very protective of that information. Sort of goes back to the question from earlier about how you differentiate the alien races when they're mm-hmm. when on a service level they're all bipedal. You know, it's, you you find ways of differentiating through their culture and through their habits. And stuff like that. So the Banu yeah. don't care oh, yeah. about history. It is a, it is a mystery. Uh, let's see. Um, how do you work to adapt or limit the lore you write into something that will become possible to actually create in the game? Uh, we do our best. Uh, uh, do you want to succeed? Conversations. Yeah, yeah, conversations. I was gonna say good communication. Yeah, uh, where we we brainstorm, you know. We and, brainstorm a lot. We also it's like if it seems like stuff's gonna have like gameplay implications, we will try to either get really cryptic in the stuff that we're talking about that's actually directly referencing gameplay, or uh, and as well as just reach out to the design team. Uh, you know, directors and stuff like that, and just say like, hey, he, you know, is this roughly accurate? Is this a completely f- flying in the face of everything that we're heading towards? Like, we, we would try to get buy-in basically from the other team members uh, before 
uh, writing anything. Um, because yeah, the last thing we want to do is say like, you know, throw out something arbitrarily that has massive gameplay implications uh, and then have to walk it back because uh, yeah, people read our stuff pretty, pretty closely. <laughs> yes. Well, that last question evidenced enough. Uh, a follow-up to the Banu question from the chat. Uh, if, if, if Banu do, don't uh, uh, savor history, they don't write down history or anything, uh, can there be Banu outlaws? Can you have a Banu with a criminal record? Yes, because it's still based off of, like, if, I, if I'm a Banu and I steal from Banu Will, Will remembers that I'm, I stole from him. And so there's... Uh, I, and I would hire a security company to collect, you know, find, track down Dave. And that contract, as long as it's in existence, would mark Dave as a wanted person. But how far that knowledge spreads, you know, maybe it's kind of a personal, immediate kind of transgression. Yeah, it feels like the Banu, there, there's less of that next step with the Banu, as, as in they, that doesn't just become a general, you are now an outlaw for, for everyone. It's it's a very personal thing at that moment, and uh, if if Will disappears or or dies, that uh, Dave may no longer be a uh, considered an outlaw yeah. because no one really no one really cares. It's it's not useful to anybody else to go track him down because that uh, whatever happened there is uh, has and the, no the contract his contract with you know Will's contract with his marks that he hired to kill me would be annulled because Will's dead. So it's sort of. Yeah, uh, as we've talked about in the past, with sort of the the kind of inherent comedy around the humans and Banu having to constantly renegotiate their trade agreement. Because uh, yeah, good job, you passed. Uh, let's talk about the Shion. How did the Shion develop? Uh, uh, this person read that they weren't at the top of the food chain. Is that r is the race that is the top of their food chain still around? That's that's really two questions. How did the Shion develop, and then is the top food is the whatever the race that was at the top the species that was well, at we, the top so we got, what thirty thousand years of history so we could, yeah, how much time yeah we got a very long time so like <laughs> i i personally have always imagined that the xian were not self-aware while they were were prey, prey animals like they maybe maybe in their like early days when they were starting to develop tools the um the predator animals that used to hunt them down and kill them all the time were around and so that's part of the reason why they developed tools and banded together in groups like this this active predation helps them develop as an actual civilization and so i also like to imagine that once they banded together and had tools to get rid of their predator um species they just got they just got rid of them like they i don't believe that at that time the predator species were self-aware like the xion were there's something interesting mm. right yeah i would also think the the long lifespan of a xion would probably benefit them because they it there's so much knowledge that they can acquire and then kind of grow over over the 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 few hundred years they're living so yeah it, uh, i could see them very quickly assessing and understanding the the apex predators around them and how to either avoid them or overcome them. I could, I could see them having them like still around as like a zoo type thing of showing like how far we've came. Like we're not afraid of this, um, elephant tiger bat anymore. Um, that's don't, that's they not live in the avatar universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like they actually have them on the zoo planet. The zoo, like, yeah. Keep yeah. Them in the preserve. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we have the Santo Kiai, uh, that's a super scary uh, creature that used to drop down from the trees and kill the heck out of Xi'an. So that, that guy's still around. Yeah, and they named a ship after him. Yeah, <laughs> like to see, like, aha, now we control the Santo Kiai. Suck it. <laughs> Don't know why I, I yield my time. I yield my time. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, maybe that would be like the real baller, like Xion move, is to have you know one of those on your compound as a pet, kind of oh, yeah. fancy collar. Yeah, the, the sort of like Pablo Escobar base. having hippos yeah. and tigers yeah. and let's, yeah. let's, let's, tiger let's, emperor. Let's move along. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, how did humans learn to communicate with the Banu they met during first contact? Uh, it was a really long process. It was, uh, I think it was Sokolovich, Neil Sokolovich was the general in charge, uh, but it was a month, several months of them working with the, the Banu uh, 
Wait, sorry, Banu or Xion? Uh, which one's which was the one for first contact? Banu, right? Banu, Banu. Banu. Yeah, yeah, Banu. Okay, uh, yeah, but it was a it was a long, a very long, weird, arduous process. Uh, but, but yeah, many Zen- Zeno linguists gave up their lives to deliver this information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is is there a character in our lore named after Britain? Not uh, yet. I do want to heart. cast him as like the um, you know, if we have like a a in lore language tutor, sort of like the Ros- a Rosetta Stone instructor would be my 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 goal. The Britain Stone. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, unless he has a preference of what he would like to appear as, but that would be my. Uh, for those who maybe don't know and just heard a name come out of nowhere and you're like, woo, uh, Britain uh, Watkins is our official Xeno linguist uh, for, for Star Citizen. And the I recommend of... watching his How to uh, Speak Xion videos. Yes. Yeah. Us. He also actually good. has a, a, a documentary too on yeah. constructed language. It's awesome. Uh, speaking of language, uh, some games allow for player characters to slowly learn alien languages, to find ruins faster and understand artifacts for better rewards, ship items, etc. With the growing library of languages for the Vanduul, the Xion, and the Banu, what are your plans for integrating these languages into the game? Uh, I mean, the you know, as outside of like just sort of pure environmental stuff. I mean, we started to kind of actually we have started integrating them in. Like, I, I believe we have Banu stuff on the some of the food vendor carts and and stuff yeah. like that. Um, yeah, we have Banu and Xi'an signage and um, Area Eighteen has a. Bunch. Yes, I was, I was I was just like, oh god, are they up yet? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it's. I think it's a. You know, the way we had always been kind of talking about it. Again, like we'll see. You know, as as they come more online. Uh, you know, I believe the early conversations was always like, you know, if you take the time to learn this this stuff, that it will, you know, open up some some possibilities and and kind of facilitate some some kind of cool stuff, and you might get to kind of navigate some social minefields that other people might fall into because they're not familiar with the language. But but it was also trying to balance it because we don't want to be punishing to people who don't have time to learn an alien language. Like that seems kind of unfair to me because right. I'm terrible. I barely speak English. Uh, and so it's like, you know, making it fun for the people and rewarding them for, for learning Xi'an, which is impressive, uh, but not being too crushing to people who haven't or make the game unplayable right. to people who haven't. I, I, that's I, I, I could see a mission that doesn't require you to have to read Banu to complete it, but a secondary objective, like an optional objective that would benefit you more if you could. Yeah. Kind of thing. Or like you, you're, you, you can read the signs on the ruins and it'll take you down a different path or something like that, that, you know, still leads to the same place, but maybe you get quicker or something. I don't know. Yeah. We also have to figure out how kind of our, you know, 30th century tech ties into this. Cause you know, we're, we're talking about how your right, Moby last right. kind of AR ties into the world around you and what information you're going to be getting for identifying stuff and whether, like, our whole idea is that if we do end up having automatic translation happening through your Moby glass, that it's rough. Like, it is the, the bare yeah. bones, like... <laughs> 70% accurate type. Thing. You know, trying to do a translation online in, like, 1999 right. kind of level of yeah. translation. Maybe so, it just translates the words in the order that they're written, but since it doesn't translate the grammar, it's like... Yeah. That you're, you're, missing out, you're missing out on the nuance, which, which I, might give you some a leg up. Uh, I We haven't talked with the design team yet about the idea that there would be a skill that you could acquire where it's like i know banu now and it like translates it differently or something like that that's kind of a i i don't know where we would fall on that yeah. so i want to make sure that folks heard the part we have not talked to design about that <laughs> just, just before i mean we could just be flashing the various comments. summaries that come <laughs> This is all. Part. This is all speculation. These are all cool ideas. You don't have like a pop up, Jared. You can just hit like a Chiron that just sort of like flashes. <laughs> of, like, have not talked to design. That just kind of. We are not describing actual gameplay. <laughs> There's so many things I'd like to say right now. <laughs> uh, sometimes my life is not my own. Uh, let's see. Is there anything you can tell us about our beloved Jerry? Hey, a question about Jerry, the band who involved in First Contact. Come on, we have some deep-seated backstory for yeah, Jerry, don't we? Deep love for Jerry. Uh, no, actually, we don't. Uh, I mean, just outside of the fact that he he was on the run from 
from some some bad news. That's why he came across uh, Vernon Tar. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think we've ever really delved it's, too deep into him. It's definitely a good uh, short story candidate, maybe for something for us fun Banu to Tar. do in the in the future. Yeah. Yeah, as we've been further developing the Banu species in general, I think it's helped kind of bring a few more specifics. So now that we've kind of honed that in a little bit, it might be a good time to to revisit and provide a little more color to, to his journey and a little more context. Um, you should yeah. be like a you should be like a, con, a con artist trying to sell fake alien relics for alien species that doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it sort of seems like th- that would probably not be too far from the truth that he would be doing something yeah he was, he was selling fake you know ship reg tags or something like that or or uh, timeshares in boca <laughs> <laughs> timeshare in pyro <laughs> or, or null or something like that um the uh cathcart uh, cuisinarts um <clears throat> we heard that the banu trade with even the van van duel how did that come about does anybody remember? Great questions. <laughs> there, it's one of those proprietary information things where they don't want us to necessarily also have trade with the Van Duel, um, where if it's a money revenue stream that they have complete control over now, so they're not exactly breaking it down. They're also not exactly advertising it. It's more just kind of like inferred from the fact that you know maybe you'll see a banu selling vandal made items and you're like how did you get those and he's like i got them <laughs> <laughs> they gave them to me for yeah. money you got them from jerry so, so yeah so so we do know from context that they are perceivably have some kind of connection with them but it's unclear what it to what extent or how they did it uh is there anything you can share about the native species of the Hades system? Um, they're dead. They are dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you want to give some back context to to what this person's referring to? They died. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, the, so for for those who don't know, the Hades system is basically it's it's kind of a wrecked totally wrecked system there's a, a planet that's been cracked in half it's basically the only thing that uh humanity sort of learned about it was like somebody used to live here a while ago and they messed each other up pretty bad uh to the point where they basically presumably wiped themselves out uh we've all had that roommate planet. yeah some uh, the, of us still do. <laughs> are you talking about toast <laughs> <laughs> No. Wow. <laughs> He's got a sword, Jared. <laughs> and he watches the show. <laughs> Hi, Toast. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll just move on. Uh, do the Tavarans speak their own language, or do they now speak human? Or common, common languages? Common languages. Common. Common. Well, um, it, it depends on where you are in the universe. I, I I, there are some some Tavern enclaves outside of the UEE that would certainly still preserve the language, but most of the Tavern that were absorbed in the UEE, when they got rid of their culture, they most likely they threw away their language too. They're just like, this is shit. This didn't serve us well. This None of this protected us when it counts. So why should we still bother to use it? I mean, again, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it might be one of those things that we once we get the language kind of online we we kind of figure it out because at the same time like i definitely that they were like you know screw rajora it was useless it was stuff but it still feels like there to me that there'd be still patches of like the language is still kind of survived because that was just their way of yeah, communication it's, it's, it's not out tiger. there yeah definitely yeah, definitely, definitely in Brenna. yeah definitely in yeah. Brenna, like probably the more like like you said the yeah the the ones who were trying to resurrect kind of the old tavarn ways would probably adhere more to it but uh, I think yeah. there's definitely been renewed interest in recent time. Sorry, Adam, yeah. go for it. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I was just, uh, it's been like 300, 300 plus years since the end of this, the the second Tavaran War and the species officially being integrated into the UEE. So that's, in, in that amount of time, you can see the language has probably dropped off a lot, but it's still not so old that it's not like Latin where it's completely lost. There are still probably people that have been been speaking it and keeping it alive. And yeah, I believe there is a, a bit of a resurgence right now. Uh, I mean, at I, least in the game world. One thing that would be really fun, you know, I mean, once we start kind of tackling the 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 language itself, would be to have the 
kind of similar what you said with with Latin, like that it's patchwork integrated into sort of human common that, or the that you might get words that carry over they might still speak kind of a dialect of it that's that's a bit more kind of integrated to kind of so the language of the tavarin is more an assimilated uee standard old tavarin and then you have the purists who are back to rajora speaking pure tavarin which is like this the broken one but a little mm. bit more kind of refrained but just to give it that sort of sense of like even their language is sort of assimilating into english uh or the ue standard um based on yeah that yeah with the with the big rejection in that whole period of time i think there's a large population of the tavarin who only speak ue standard like <laughs> that's it. That's that's their language. And now you start getting people maybe who grew up only speaking standard who are like, I would like to connect more with my my past. I'm going to take a, a class to try to learn how to speak Tavarn again. And, right. and to Adam's point, it's real interesting because this isn't like a lost language like we've encountered where we don't understand ancient Greek because we have recordings like we encountered them in a digital age. So there's yeah. like well documentation on on mm -hmm. this language. You know, yeah, and even though even though they did purge their culture after the Second Devarn War and tried to clear a lot of that out, yeah, there'd still be a digital record. And the cobble system was recently discovered, which a, bond, a bunch of ancient Devarn artifacts yeah, yeah. there. So that's always a well we can go to and say, you know, like the the, the language or things that might have been lost uh, have been refound here. Yeah, and from a linguistics perspective, 600 years is a very long time. Like, we don't speak the same language. Uh, like, we speak English right yes. now, us, us here, but English 600 years ago did not sound like this. Yeah. So, like, the Teverin that exists now, even if there was an unbroken chain from the Teverin on Khalith to the Teverin on Brana, they're not going to speak the exact same language yeah. just because of how language changes. Yeah, you can't uh, read uh, the uh, Canterbury uh, Tales right now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, <laughs> Wanda Tapriu, the shore, Sota. The drop and that it pass it to Rota and pirate every vein and swish the cour of which we're doing. Anyway, come back. <laughs> well, and I've seen the conversation on, on, on Spectrum about people being like, well, in 29, you know, 50, humans would not be sounding anything like we like. Right. We, our writing is pretty present. We, we have chosen not to do like some authors do that really cool thing where they create, you know, almost an entirely new language to show how different it's come over the hundreds of years and that's probably that, is that might be sure. more accurate but yeah but we we definitely you know have gone for more of a stylized version of the future yeah. so um because yeah, I, I know similar to like the the it's a sty the stylistic choice of like the no ai thing like it was sort of a choice to make it not that sort of very you know unusual sounding uh, English language to keep it conversational so it still sounds grounded and real to us as players uh, rather than trying to accurately depict or predict what you know English will evolve to or various languages will evolve to in 900 years which right. I do not have the brain capacity for <laughs> yeah like like when you're watching a movie and everyone's Russian and you're like, why are they speaking with British accents? It's one of those suspension of disbeliefs in order to be able to tell the story right. so um I kind of follow me up on that. the the the, qu the question is: how, is do you plan to flesh out multiple religions for each race, similar to has humans? I want to tweak that a bit. How do you how do you not go down the rabbit hole? <laughs> like, how do you know how far you're supposed you you're supposed to go with this stuff before you're like, all right, this isn't the core central thing of the entire game here. It's you know, come back. I've got a lot of oh. other things to do. <laughs> how, how how do you how do you manage not just falling down the rabbit hole in any of these one things. Who says we ever left the rabbit hole? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of it comes from need. Like maybe we start with the base supposition of like they have a lot of religions. Like with the Banu, we said they they're going to have a lot of different belief systems that they try to incorporate in. And that's enough for us to start going on. And then we start filling that in as we need it. So talking about like the God of luck is a very important one. And so we've learned a little bit more about how that works. Um, or we decide that they're a little more monotheistic and like, you know, like the Tavarin had this major belief that was instilled as part of their culture. And that's kind of surmounted, like it was part of their identity and so that focused it in 
so I think it's usually like that. Like we can say, like even for the human stuff, like there's a bunch of sports. Like humans play a bunch of different sports, but we talked about set of all. Like <laughs> you know, it's just it, we just have to pick and choose our battles. And a lot of times, it's it's that need. I'm writing this thing right now, and I need more detail about this, so I'm going to dive into it because otherwise, you'll just go crazy. You can just sit it's, forever thinking of bands for hundreds of years and like. Yeah. And I think it's also one of those things. I always kind of try to equate a lot of this to to, um, to drawing a picture where you draw in the sort of like block shapes to to block out your composition mm-hmm. and your sizes and your framing and, and stuff like that. And then and then you you fill in the refine details down, as you yeah. go and you refine down uh, as, you, yeah, as you need it, is, it, as opposed to like starting really detailed and trying to do a picture. It'll take you forever. It's like you kind of get what you need to get you through and sell what you're trying to sell uh you know as far as the flavor or a location or something like that and you know and then just kind of move forward because again there's so much stuff to cover that like you know hopefully as we are moving down we're still filling in all these little getting specific on stuff because we go oh we need a new you know tavarin i don't want you know i have this uh banu and i don't want him to worship Terranin, so i want him to do a new god so i got to come up with a new god i don't know what the hell that was but uh <laughs> Uh, but that's it. So now we have a Dark second side. one that we can swap in there and stuff. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just about kind of, kind of trying to keep moving forward. I, I think this is a really interesting difference between the kind of nonlinear storytelling we do and a more traditional linear storytelling, where if you know exactly where you're walking and where you go, you can fill in a lot of detail on that path so that your character goes to this one bar and has this one drink and you can describe the full history of that. But with us covering anyone can do so many different things it becomes a lot harder to have that kind of controlled and level of detail so like you know dave's analogy was great for that kind of high level you know rough sketch and then filling it in the details as we go okay. um are those two two cans on your shirt uh yes okay one two <laughs> um how let me see what else really got. Uh, do I really have the uh, Canterbury Tales memorized in the Old English? Yes. And because I make bad bets. <laughs> see, not shaving until 3.0 comes out. <laughs> when I commit, I commit, people. Uh, how developed are the developing species, such as the Asoans? So we talked about them a little earlier. Uh, will we have cities... Will they, will they have cities and forms of transportation? Uh, or... How de- how developed is developing? I mean, the, uh, again, originally the the idea was that they were it was anything kind of below spacefaring. Uh, that the idea that the Fair Chance Act was you know everyone is going to you know all the cultures are going to leave this this species alone until they basically take off and go, get into space and then they'll be basically met by you know uh, some vandal uh, a kid. Um, but and then they can be sort of integrated into the galaxy as a spacefaring species. Uh, but now that we're sort of able to do full planetary exploration, which again back in t- 2012 was a dream, uh, you know, I think we're probably going to shave it down. I don't know. It's an interesting question. It feels like it's easier to make it not as make them not as developed technologically so it's easier to just make a world and then it's just a a type of creature that's sort of running around on the surface of the world rather than like having to develop architecture or vehicles or stuff like that it's like they were in the 1800s or equivalent of our 1800s type thing so uh i don't know it's going to be an interesting question the the fair chance to act overall is very interesting to me because i don't think it's not everyone agrees with it like there's some people who think it's mean not to lift up a developing species if we have like medicine and they're suffering from a disease is it really right that we don't help them so like that's one of the science fiction kind of stories that i'm really fascinated by and i hope we get a chance to explore that more as we go yeah there's um a developing there are a few developing species in the genesis system there's um a group of cephalopod-like 
species who are just beginning to explore the surface of their world and they have engaged in warfare with a land dwelling species who doesn't like them and the people who are observing are like ethically should we interfere in this because there's a good chance that one could wipe the other out and does that violate the tenets of the fair chance act on its own because it's an it's a very murky issue lots of interesting perspectives you're in the ue senate Bill comes up to eradicate the Fair Chance Act. Do you vote to keep it or get rid of it? I would keep it. Dave? I'd keep it. Will? Uh, man, I would modify it. <laughs> <laughs> I just... But basically, the- I would acknowledge that these are claimed planets that we don't have a right to, but I, I would probably push for opening contact with these species. All right, but the bill the, the bill them. up for vote is just to abolish it, not to amend it. Do you keep it or do you abolish it? Uh, like, it. Because abolishing it's the can, next step to changing it? Like, no, I would keep it until I can introduce a new law. Okay. <laughs> Adam? Uh, I, I, I would keep it, All right. personally. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I would point out the Fair Chance Act, you know, doesn't just um, apply to developing species. It can also affect, like, mining rights to certain areas and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, if, if a species is developing, they don't want people up in the asteroid belt or going down to the planet to pull out these valuable resources and potentially mess with any of the species there. So there's even one candidate in the current uh, final five of the imperator election, Paul LaSalle, who one of his core campaign promises is to basically revisit the Fair Chance Act as a way to open it up for miners to be able to maybe use new technologies or access certain areas of the empire that were previously off limit. So there is a there is a pro business stance too. It's like maybe it needs to be refined because we can do this in a better way that can benefit both humanity, uh, you know, and the UEE and the economy without necessarily affecting the development of these species. So there's lots of different areas that it does split up uh, into. Yeah. Uh, were the Xi'an actually willing adversaries in the, in the Cold War, or was it just the Messers using a, a conveniently scary neighbor as a means of controlling the empire? Someone's done the reading. <laughs> I'd say uh, a little of both. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, we, the what kicked it all off was basically some human terraformers came charging into a system and just started terraforming a planet without checking to see if it was uninhabited. Uh, so that doesn't send a great message. Uh, so there was definitely some antagonism from the, the Xi'an. Uh, uh, on the flip side, what's the most petty or silly situation where the Xi'an would use anti-grav technology to solve a problem? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do we need to set up the Xi'an's uh, 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 admiration for anti-grav, or is that self-explanatory at this point? Uh, no, I mean they're they're highly developed. Uh, have, they have really good anti-grav tech. Uh, a lot of the human knowledge of anti-gravity comes from our uh, contact with the Xi'an and their technology. Um, I almost. I almost want to say that in their time, their development timeline, like they came up with that before they came up with space travel. Uh, yes, like, I believe so. Yeah, they're they did. real. They're real good at it. So, what would be the most petty or silly situation they'd use any gravity <laughs> for? Um, let's see. Uh, my so, idea is that so they use anti grav at the dinner table. <laughs> so to, to like levitate tables and levitate chairs. So uh, if uh, Xi'an comes to join the big family meal and she finds that there's no chair she just like whip out an anti-grav device and kind of hover there <laughs> like, uh, like those you... extending seats that people bring mm-hmm. to just sit back okay. we have talked about like their, their kind of like ancestral clothing these really like ornate <laughs> outfits so it'd be funny to me if something got like a really heavy outfit that has a bunch of intricate things sewn into it that they use a little helper device when they're walking around so they don't get weighed down. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, so oh, no. A couple quick ones here. With the 2950 elections coming around, what are the candidates' feelings towards the way Tavarin within the Empire have been treated? That's your quick last question? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
All right, you, you want to do that? I'll, gotta, I'll do it. No, 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 we can do it. I just don't. No, 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 no. You're gonna get a, you're gonna get a bad one next because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, go. You're 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 the most fluent. In, in yeah, the- um, it's it varies. Most of them like would like to kind of like better integrate them into the or at least are going to put forward the idea that they want to be better integrated in into the empire because Su- Koji has become a senator because there does seem to be a rise of uh, people of, of Tavar and kind of rediscovering their culture. So they're trying to appeal to that voter base. Um, uh, a lot of the more extremist views on Tavar and human alien species didn't make it into the final five. Though there's people out there that like to say it. I think the closest may be like Paul Asal who thinks they deserve equality but not special treatment is kind of his stance on it yeah um, both both leilani addison and mira neo have have called out specifically that they would probably create programs that would um aim to better integrate the Tavarin into the empire uh, mira no i think would even want to set like a certain percentage of each each UE office would to ha- had to have, let's say, ten percent uh, Tavarn working in it as a way to integrate their ideas and their influence into the UE. So um, there are some people that, if anything, are going to be more proactive about trying to get them to participate. Uh, those those uh, there's no bad will in these final five candidates. If anything, they're just would raise their hands and be like, they can lift themselves up by their own bootstraps and they have the same opportunity as anybody else if they if they, if they want right. to try to achieve that. All right, the Not only bad my vote. here. Yeah. Aww. All right, this last question is exclusively for Will. Uh, oh. please, please do your best Banu impersonation. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That's about what I've come to expect. Oh, that worked for me. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here on Star Citizen Live Alien Week Roundtable. I uh, hope you enjoyed the, our conversation about the lore, the history, the background of some of Star Citizen's alien races uh, set to populate the Persistent Universe. As as we have been doing the last couple of weeks, we are going to send the raid on over to another Star Citizen streamer. I'm being told it's Uber Nerd. So we are going to raid Uber Nerd today. Uh, so you should see that prompt coming up. If you're watching live, uh, you can opt in for that. Uh, tell them Molly says hi. And uh, for Star Citizen Live, I'm Jared. Uh, let's see if I can get directions. That's Sherry. That's Dave. That was Will. That's Adam. And uh, we'll see you next week, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>